Christians Institute, Gordon went home to be with the Lord as he sat on the stage in the Institute building in a Sunday service. His widow, Frida, took over the leadership of the ministry, serving until she retired at age 93, passing the baton to her youngest son, Dennis, who continues the rich family legacy together with his wife, Ginger, and their three children, Missy, Hani, and Golan. God has a special purpose for each of us to fulfill in life that no one else can, and the only truly happy people are those in whom God's purpose for them is achieved. Gordon Lindsay had served as an evangelist, church planner, pastor, author, entrepreneur, apostolic leader, and teacher. He will be remembered as a man of prayer, as a man who believed God's word, and as a man who lived humbly in obedience to the call of God on his life. He summarized the pursuit of his life in this statement, the power of the gospel has not abated, nor has the great commission that Christ gave been changed. In fulfillment of the dream God put in his heart when he got saved, Gordon lived to see the transforming power of the gospel bring salvation, healing, and deliverance to multitudes in every nation of the world. motivated me to come to CFNI was I was praying about what the Lord wanted me to do and I was just in a really dark place and I didn't I just heard his audible voice super clear and told me to come to CFNI I just came my experience at CFNI has been really life-changing um, I've become a completely new person in Christ so take a leap of faith and the Lord's gonna provide no matter what you're a world changer come get trained discipleship starts and ends with Jesus. It's not contingent on our great effort. It is the work and the plan of Jesus. You need to know how, but you must know why. Why are you fighting the fight you're fighting? Why are you pressing into the things of God? 
these commandments. They're not the Ten Suggestions, they're the Ten Commandments. Dennis and I would like to welcome all of you tonight. We are excited that you're here, and we know you're going to be blessed by our anointed speakers. Luke 1 says, No word of God shall be void of power. That's a powerful scripture. You know the devil cannot stand against one thing, the word of God. He's relentless, but so are we. Healing is ours, but we have to take it. So renew your mind with the Word of God tonight and say, I'm not giving up. No, I'm not giving up. We look forward to hearing the many testimonies of what God has done in and through you and for you. So let us hear from you, and God bless you. And I want to bless you as well, because God has something good for all of you that have come to join us to see what the Holy Spirit is going to manifest during the next coming hours. Yes, I have been raised in a home that believes in the supernatural, the gifts of the Spirit and healing. And I know the Lord has some of these manifestations for you and to touch your spirit. And I look forward to hearing those testimonies as well, because our God has a plan for all of us, not to harm us, but to bless us and to give us hope in a future. Yes, so I encourage you, pray during this time that God's will will be done in your life and all those that have come. Amen.
Let's all stand. It's a wonderful day. How have you guys been? Or let's try that one more time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Are you guys ready to worship? Yes. I am too. I'm looking forward to it. Welcome to Christ for the Nations. We're so blessed to have you and we're looking forward to a wonderful time tonight. If you are trying to recognize where this accent is from, I am from Jamaica, the most beautiful country in the world. So, <laughs> all right, so good to have you. Let's pray if you can lift your hands with me. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you that you are the God of all flesh. We thank you that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, we give you praise this evening. We welcome you in this house. We say, come and tabernacle with us, the God who lives, the God who dwells among his people. We say, come tonight. Let your manifest presence be in this house. Lord, we thank you for healing, for signs, for wonders, for deliverance. We thank you that you will break chains tonight, that you will break cords and yokes. We thank you that you will loose people from generational curses. Father, we thank you that you will open up the portals tonight and that your glory would descend in this place. Lord, we thank you for the spirit of faith in this house. I bind doubt and unbelief right now in the name of Jesus. And we say, doubt, go. You have no authority you have no place in this house we decree that faith is in this house lord we thank you that there is a there is a move of faith lord there is a river of faith in this house lord rest upon the hearts of your people rest upon the worship team rest upon the speakers tonight lord let your glory be felt in this house and we give you all the glory tonight in the name of jesus put your hands together tonight High five somebody beside you and say, let's worship God tonight. Come on, high five your neighbor and say, let's worship God tonight. We welcome the CF and our worship team. Guys, let's do this. Let's sing this together. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you.
there is no one like our God. Come on, can we just give him worship? Can we just open our mouth and begin to just love on him tonight? There is no one like you, Lord. <laughs> there is no one like
is he that makes me happy? Who is he that makes me happy? Who is he that gives me peace? Who is he that brings me comfort? He brings you comfort and turns your bitter into sweet. <laughs> That's our God. Echo 
heaven tonight and sing how great. Come on, let's lift it up. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. <laughs> and all will see how great, how great is our God. moving right now. There's no one like you, Jesus. Yeah, come on, come on, just begin to just sing your own song to the Lord tonight.
I feel like we need to go back into that chorus. The God who picks up all the pieces. I just sense that so strongly. If God has ever wiped away grief out of your eyes, if he has ever washed away betrayal, the sting of betrayal out of your heart, if he has ever lifted you up out of rejection, is there anybody here that you have walked through and you have seen the hand of God, the God who counsels us in the midst of depression. He counsels you to the point that you feel like you want to live again. Have you ever experienced? I just heard that chorus and my heart just started rejoicing. Been there, been there, been there. When the voice of God stirred my heart out of depression, been there, been there. Oh, we love you tonight, Jesus. Can we decree that again? When I thought he picked up all the pieces, he's the defender, the God who heals hearts, not just the miracle of the physical body. Come on, let's stand together and declare this. The God who heals.
We love physical healing, and that's good. We love, we, we love to see the hands grow and the feet grow, the eyes open and the ears open. That's beautiful, that's good. But God heals hearts. <laughs> oh, that thing got me excited. I said, God heals hearts. <laughs> Oh, high five somebody and say to them, God heals hearts. God heals hearts. 
And I love it. The Bible says he does not reject the brokenhearted. The Bible says he draws nigh to the brokenhearted. Don't you love that about God? Yes. Sometimes people see you hurting and they, they will avoid you. They will avoid you. But God doesn't avoid you. He draws nigh to you and he embraces you. He wraps you in his arms. And you want to live again. You have hope. You are inspired. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I'm so excited. I really am. I really am. The song bless my heart. Come on, let's put our hands together for Jesus. Yes. Jesus. I remember, sometimes you just have to remember the goodness of God, you know. I remember years ago when my mom died. Oh my God, it was so painful. It was sudden. She was strong, healthy, everything was okay. And she had a stroke and died within four days. And my heart was broken, broken in many places. I love my mom. And I was so hurting and I went to church, led worship. And a stranger visited the church, a stranger. And the stranger walked up to me at the end and gave me a hug and said to me, I knew it was God. The stranger said to me, God sees your pain. God has wrapped his arms around you and God is healing you today from the hurt that you're walking through. Oh my God, in the moment, the sorrow and the grief that I was in, that thing broke in the moment. In the moment. So I'm telling you, God has a way of healing you. Sometimes it might take a process. Sometimes it might be a year, two years. Sometimes as you walk with God, He heals you. Sometimes it's instantaneous. He heals you. So open up your heart tonight. You never know how God will do it. As you worship God tonight, as you hear the guest speaker, in this moment, God can turn it just like that. Instantaneous healing of your heart. I don't know what you guys are going through or who. I don't know because sometimes we say things and you just never know who it is for. If you're here tonight and you are carrying that at heart, let me tell you, God can heal you in a moment. All right? So high five somebody one more time and say, welcome to Christ for the nations. Welcome. We're so glad to have you. You may be seated. So glad to have you here tonight. Media, can you go ahead and play those two videos? Thank you so much. Dennis and I would like to welcome all of you tonight. We are excited that you're here and we know you're going to be blessed by our anointed speakers. Luke 137 says, No word of God shall be void of power. That's a powerful scripture. You know the devil cannot stand against one thing, the word of God. He's relentless, but so are we. Healing is ours, but we have to take it. So renew your mind with the Word of God tonight and say, I'm not giving up. No, I'm not giving up. We look forward to hearing the many testimonies of what God has done in and through you and for you. So let us hear from you and God bless you. And I want to bless you as well because God has something good for all of you that have come to join us to see what the Holy Spirit is going to manifest during the next coming hours. Yes, I have been raised in a home that believes in the supernatural, the gifts of the Spirit and healing. And I know the Lord has some of these manifestations for you and to touch your spirit. And I look forward to hearing those testimonies as well because our God has a plan for all of us, not to harm us, but to bless us and to give us hope in a future. Yes, so right. I encourage you, pray during this time that God's will will be done in your life and all those that have come. Amen. It's normal in Northern Nigeria to be a Muslim. Christians are not welcome there. Persecution against Christians is not uncommon. Violence became such a normal reality that we had to learn to stand up for the defenseless in our community. The persecution that we have faced together has drawn us closer to God and to each other. I was inspired to come to CFNI by my pastor, Reverend Akila, and the late Archbishop Benson Idahusa and Randy Delph. As this dream to come to CFNI grew in my heart, I saw an extraordinary increase in my income. 
the Lord made it clear to me that this provision was for my time at CFNI. I knew that I needed to take the steps of faith. I went to the embassy for my visa interview without having to first pay my service fee for my I-90. It was practically impossible for anyone to be given the visa without first paying this fee. The visa was miraculously given to me. The way these things unfold could only have been the hand of God moving on my behalf. Door after door opened up, and before I knew it, I was sitting in the institute building as if and I with my heart ready to receive. My classmate became my community and made me feel at home. And for the first time, I noticed the absence of discrimination of whatever race you are. I knew it would be hard to leave behind my wife and my newborn son in Nigeria, but I trusted God. It's amazing looking back to see the grace of God in my marriage. Hello, sweetheart. The steps of faith that I took to come to CFNI has brought so much fruit, not only in my life, but in my family and the lives that my family impacts. At the end of every phone call, it is so beautiful to see the affection of my son, my last son, Jamo, as he sent me kisses through the phone with the rest of the children. He's kissing, he's kissing the phone. Even in separation, the Lord has maintained my relationship with my family and brought us even closer together. Oh, he's missing his daddy, right? Coming here was not just my own decision, but my wife and my true children had to decide to send me off by faith. Their support has meant everything to me, and the Lord has been faithful to strengthen my family during this season. CFNI will teach you how to move out of religion into a relationship with God, and open you to discover your purpose and calling here on earth. If you're looking for a place to do this, come to CFNI. It is arguably the best place to sharpen the calling God has placed. So again, welcome to Christ for the Nations. How many of you, how many of you are here that this is your first time at CFNI? Can you stand, please? <laughs> Look at that. Okay, let's give them a big CFNI welcome. Welcome to Christ for the Nations. On behalf of our leadership here, we are so glad to have you guys. All right, before you, before you're seated, before you're seated, just shout. Let me hear. Where are some of you guys from? Where are you from? Wisconsin. That accent, I can't even say it the same way they said it. Wisconsin. <laughs> All right, where are you from? I'm ch Michigan and San Antonio, Texas. Where are you from? Honduras. Chrissy, you have people here, Honduras. All right, where are you from? Right here in Texas. <laughs> First time, that's good though. Fort Worth, okay, so we have some Texans here, first time. Rockwall, Rockwall is beautiful, I like that part of, of that, Texas. Um, where are you from? Okay, Texas, okay. Sorry, where are you from? Burleson, and that's, where is that? Oh, <laughs> so Jamaican asking, where is that? Texas, okay, where are you from? Gainesville, Texas. Look at that. Let's give it up one more time for these wonderful people that have traveled from far and near to be here with us. We're so grateful. Christ for the Nations is a missions organization. We're in our 74th year. Can you believe that? Started years ago by Gordon and Frida Lindsay. The Bible school started in 1970. So this is what? The 52nd year of the Bible school. So missions and teaching training, beautiful combination, beautiful synergy. So we're so grateful that you guys have come into this place. Rich history, rich legacy, 50 plus years, right? So thank you so much. You could have been anywhere, all you guests, but you're here at CFNI tonight. I'm always mindful of that, you know, when people do things that they don't have to do, you know, yeah, appreciate them. So we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, can I do this? Miss Ginger, can you come quickly, please? I just want them to meet the visionary behind the Voice of Healing and Prophetic Conference. 
I know you heard her on the video, but I just want you to see her in person and hear a greeting from her. I'm putting her on the spot. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much for coming. I know that you've come from so many different places and you, you've come because you want to get more of the Lord and you want to receive healing. You want to receive all he has for you. And so I just am grateful that you're here tonight and uh, I'm so happy to be here too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Come on, let's give it up one more time for Mrs. Ginger Lindsay. We are here because she is walking with a vision that God gave to her a few years ago. And then we have the Lindsay family. Can you guys stand up? The Lindsay family. Let's recognize them, celebrate them, and honor them. Dr. Lindsay, Chrissia is here. Missy. They are the visionaries here. We're so grateful for them. So grateful for them. All right. Always honor people. Always do that. I believe in that. Are, have you guys been enjoying the conference? Yes, we are so blessed. We have some wonderful speakers, and I know you guys have been enjoying it. I've been hearing, hearing some of the testimonies. So good. All right, just to give you a few announcements before um, I move on. Okay, so tomorrow morning we will begin at 8 a.m. Say 8 a.m. Right here. Okay. And then just to let you know, lunch and dinner, it's available in the cafeteria at a low cost of $10. So you can eat with the students. $10. That's good, right? You don't have to go to McDonald's. Stay right here. Fellowship with our students. There is a merch table in the lobby. If you want to wear a merchandise, please buy, support CFNI, and promote the voice of feeling, right? They have some lovely, lovely things out there. I saw them earlier. Um, also, if you want to learn more about CFNI, we have a table out there because you're here as a conference guest and you've seen the worship, you're hearing, you know, all these wonderful um, lessons and just being exposed to this. You might want to learn more about the organization or the institute. You might want to come here as a student. So there's a table out there. Please check that out. We would love to have you here as a student so that we can equip you to do the work of God. So many times people have passion and desire, but they need training. All right. So if you need training, just check out the table out there. Would you help me welcome one of our staff members, Miss Renee? Come on, Miss Renee. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. My famous words. Praise the Lord. I love to say praise the Lord. Can you praise the Lord? Praise him. Praise the Lord. Amen. He is a good God. Hallelujah. I'm just taking the offering, guys. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is good. I like to say praise the Lord. He's been good to me. You hear me? He's been good to me. Hallelujah. Has he been good to you? Has he been good to you? Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He's a good God. Oh, he knows how to dry the tears. He knows how to restore the soul. Glory to God. He knows how to put the band-aids and put in the alcohol and clean all those areas. He knows what to do. Hallelujah. He's a good God. He's a good God. Holy Spirit, I've been watching the different speakers that come, and I've been looking at how the Holy Spirit is ministering through so many vessels, so many vessels, and how the different things that they're speaking and how it's touching so many hearts. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what we need. Sometimes you might sit there and start crying, and you don't even know why you're crying, but the Holy Spirit knows. He's such a good God. He's a good God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I thank God for Christ for the nations. This place has been good to me. It's hard for me to talk about this. When I came here, I was broken for real. I was so broken. And I didn't even know I was broken. You know, can you be broken and not know you're broken? And I would sit there in class and tears would just be falling from my eyes. I'm wondering, what the world? You know, I had no idea what in the world is wrong with me. People were looking at me, you okay? I said, I'm fine. Praise the Lord. I don't know what's wrong with me. Because I had no clue that the Holy Spirit was healing deep, deep, deep wounds. Hallelujah. He knows how to reach down and to get the root. Hallelujah. Yes, he does. Hallelujah. He makes you feel good. Thank you, Jesus. I can't help but say praise the Lord. 
I can't help but say praise the Lord. This is good ground. If you're wondering about Christ for the nation, this is good ground. It's good ground. We're not perfect, but this is good ground. It's good ground. When you give to this ministry, you're going to be blessed. Because God is using Christ for the nations all over the world. There are so many ministries and lives being touched. So many. When you give to Christ for the nations, know that your seed is going into the ground for the glory of the Lord God. Not for man, for the glory of the Lord God. And he knows what he's doing. The Holy Spirit, you know, technology, I'm, I'm, I'm not young. Praise the Lord. So when it comes to technology, you're going to put the uh, ways to give. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Everybody going to say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Okay. You can uh, uh, go online, cfn.org slash give. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for putting that up. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. And you can text to give. You know, young people like the, <laughs> those young people like technology. Now, they even have snail mail. I still send out letters, guys. I still use, I have stamps in my purse right now. I still send letters. Amen. Praise God. It works. And then we have Zell. Zell at cfni.org. Praise God. God is a good God. He's a good God, and he knows exactly. If you're sitting in this place, the Holy Spirit brought you here. And if your heart is open, God will meet what your heart needs. If you've come to Christ for the nations, you will be blessed. Bring your grandchildren. Bring your children. Come. You will be changed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So we've all passed out all the envelopes. Anybody need more time? Thank you, Holy Spirit. God is a good God. This is actually, uh, <laughs> this is actually Kipling's job. <laughs> this is not my job. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> God is helping me up here. Believe me, I tried to get out of this. Glory to God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God's working on Renee. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God's a good God. I love him too, boy. I love him. Okay, you ready to pray? <laughs> Amen. Father, we worship you. We honor you, God. We worship you, Father. Everything we do is for you. Every soul is for you, God. Every training, every class, it's all for you, Father. It's all for you. We thank you for what you're doing. And, Father, we, we thank you that every person that gives, Lord, no matter how small that donation may be, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you bless their finances, that you bless their families, that you will meet their needs, even the ones that came here with no money. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Open the gates, Lord, and work your divine plan. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> amen. Thank you, Lord. Huh? Oh, yeah, that's right. Praise the Lord. See, that's why I need him. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, if you give $50 or more, today they have a, a book giveaway. Yesterday, it was the Bible. Today, it's um, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And tomorrow, it's going to be uh, Dr. Lindsay's new book, Jehovah Sneaky. Now, if you would prefer to have the Bible today instead of the, the book, you can still get the, the Bible, okay? But it's a gift from the Lindsay's. They just want to bless you. Praise God. Did I get it, Kipling? Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Don't you just love how, she, how transparent she is? She is real. She's one of those staff members. She is so real, and we love that. We have different people here. We, it's, I say it like this, unity in diversity.
diversity in unity. This is the body of God. We have so many different nationalities working here at Christ for the Nations. So as I said earlier, I am Kipling and I am from Jamaica. We have lots of other internationals. Chrissia Lindsay, she is from Honduras. We have lots. So when you come here, you will be exposed to this beautiful El Salvador. She was born in El Salvador. She lived in Honduras. Okay, El Salvador. But my point is, we are Christ for the nations. It's not just our name. We reflect it in the organization. So thank you so much, Miss Renee. Let's give it up for Miss Renee one more time. All right, before I introduce the guest speaker, so tomorrow afternoon, say tomorrow afternoon. Okay, we're going to have some speakers in the breakout session. So Dr. Edith Prakash, she will be in here at 1.30. That's in here at 1.30. And then Christiane Peixota, she will be in here at 3.30. Uh, Stephen Springer, he will be in the Wynn Myers Auditorium at 1.30 and at 3.30. That will be Andrew Brown. So lots of interesting things planned tomorrow. So ensure that you are here, whether in the IB for those two or in the Wayne Myers. Also tomorrow morning, we're going to have Dr. Paula Burt and Dr. Don Colbert in here for the morning session. So ensure that you are up early and ready to feast on what God has put in their hearts for you guys. Have you guys been enjoying this evening so far? All right, let me get out of the way because I want to hear. I love this. I was thinking about this earlier. Miss Ginger, this is very comprehensive of you because you just didn't focus on the healing of the body this time. The fact that you have brought a doctor to speak to us, that is good. That is balance. Somebody say balance. Because Pentecostal people love to talk everything about spirit. And I am Pentecostal charismatic. Yes, we love that. But God gave us a body, not just a spirit. Are you with me? He gave us a body and a spirit. We have a soul too, right? But a body. So that Miss Ginger brought a doctor here. So we will hear how to treat the body, how to treat it well, how to take care of the temple. Don't you just love balance? Yes, we appreciate that. So thank you, Miss Ginger, for doing that, bringing balance. All right. Dr. Don Colbert and Mary Colbert. Dr. Don has been a board-certified family practice doctor for more than 25 years in both Orlando, Florida, and most recently in Dallas, Texas. He is also a board-certified, he's also board-certified through the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine and has received extensive training in nu nutritional and preventative medicine. He's a New York Times best-selling author of three books and has sold more than 10 million copies worldwide. He's a frequent guest on multiple national television programs. He's also been featured on TV networks such as ABC News and Fox News. He resides with his wife, Mary Colbert, where they split their time between Orlando, Florida, and Dallas, Texas, to serve both his patient base and spend time with their grandchildren. She's a New York Times best-selling co-author with her husband of The Seven Pillars of Health and co-author of The Trump Prophecies. She's also the founder of Nation Builders, a national prayer line dedicated to prayer for the United States and for the wisdom of God. Nation Builders has grown to tens of thousands, including many of the most influential pastors in America, joining the calls in all 50 states. With her husband, Mary Colbert, also runs two health and anti-aging practices in Texas and Florida, and they have a successful health supplement company known as Divine Health. Will you stand with me and let's welcome to Christ for the Nations, Dr. Don and Mary Colbert. We are so grateful to have you. Thank you for the wisdom that God has given to you and the experience that you guys both carry. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you brother. Thank you, thank you. Boy, we are excited to be here. Thank you for coming. Please sit down. Do you see the shoes? <laughs> It's all about the shoes, right, ladies? I believe in the scriptures that tell us how beautiful are the feet of those. I take it literal. <laughs> so I thought I'd bring my sparkles. Praise God. Church, back in 1977, I was out there as a student. 
here, right here. Can you hear me? Testing, testing. In 1977, I was a student. Right out there, I was 18 years old. I, I was actually my roommate at that time was Dutch Sheets. You know that fella? <laughs> he married us. Yes, amen. But praise God, this is uh, what happened is my family had moved from Tupelo, Mississippi to a little town in Mississippi called Forest. And he opened a store called Fred's Dollar Store, and it was in Morton, Mississippi, where one of God's great evangelists, Wayne Myers, was there. Wayne Myers had started a fire in the young people in Morton, Mississippi. And literally, all these teenagers were going to Christ for the nations. And I came from the biggest party school in the U.S. at that time. It was Ole Miss, University of Mississippi. But God had put me with a Christian roommate who was a mighty man of God. And then that summer, it was a setup. Because I, uh, there was no one there except for these Christians. So I was hanging out with these crazy, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, just full of faith Christians. And they had prayer meetings day and night. So this is the craziest thing I've ever seen, but I want it because I felt the joy. I felt the peace. I felt just tremendous love, and I wanted that. And that's what we want. And I was born again, and through Wayne Myers, filled with the Holy Ghost, came here for one year, and then I went to... Oral Roberts University, <laughs> and I graduated in 1980. I went to med school, became a medical doctor in 1984, and, but in 1983, something major happened to me. You see, as a requirement at ORU, we had to run three miles, and in order to do it, if, in order to only do it once a year, I had to do it in a really good time. I was in med school in my hardest rotation, internal medicine, and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I was in good shape, real good shape back then. No problem. Real good shape. <laughs> but, come, well, excellent shape back then. I'm pretty good now. But then what happened, church, it, it, we had to run this three-mile run in a certain time, and, it, and you had to do it really fast in order to only run it once. It just so happened it was in August. It just so happens it was in the high 90s with almost 100% humidity. Well, I was determined to do it, so I ran it, and I was out in front, and I wasn't in the front, but I was one of the front. But then within 50 yards from the finish line, something happened. Literally, I felt my legs wouldn't go. I had no control of my legs. My wife looked at me, and she said, it looked like you had been hit by a car. And literally, my legs wouldn't go. I was 50 yards from the finish line. And I literally, my legs were wobbling. I had no control over my muscles. And I said, what on earth is happening? And I made it. I fell over the finish line. I was foaming at the mouth. I had suffered a massive heat stroke. Now, a heat stroke is different from heat exhaustion. This kills a lot of people every year. It was so hot, I had quit sweating. And literally, the heat built up in my system. My temperature was 108 degrees. My muscles and my legs burst. They burst. And I had no control over my muscles. I willed myself over the finish line. And Mary, tell them, what did I look like when I was running? Well, what was frightening is I was sitting underneath over by the <laughs> baseball field. And I was doing, let me just say this. When God brings two people together, the more opposite they are, the more called they are. So if you're looking for someone to be just like you, the need for one of you is omitted. God brings opposites together. And he and I could <laughs> not <opposite>. have been <laughs> more opposite. Right. I was a street preacher. I was down in Peoria in Tulsa, went in the prostitute and drug addicts to Jesus. And he was back in pre-med. And when I first saw him, he was modeling a t-shirt, 220 pound bodybuilder. My roommate and I, we were sitting back in the back of the auditorium and we were like, where's he been? <laughs> Guys, let me just tell you, that ring by spring is real. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> I hung out in two places she never hung out, 
The gym and the library. <laughs> okay. She never went to either place. And that's what I found out. That's why I never knew where he was. <laughs> so I went to Rama. I graduated from Rama, and I had I just finished Rama, and I was underneath the tree reading the word, and I look and I see him coming. We'd been married one year. And here he comes, and it looked like there was no muscles in his legs. It looked like compound fractures. And I screamed, fall down, fall down, fall down. And he refused to fall down (laughs) because he was determined to finish the race. He was determined. That's the kind of man this guy is. He is going to finish his race. No matter what, I was going to cross that. That's right. And he fell over, and well, the... The um, athletic director was there, and he knew exactly what was going on with him. So they threw him in the back of a station wagon. Well, first of all, two Marines had already died that year of massive heat strokes. They They put me in the sprinklers. I was covered with water. Then they put me in the back of the station wagon, took me across the street to the City of Faith Hospital. Now, great hospital, City of Faith. But when we went there, guess what? It was such a hot, humid day. Everyone was outside of the ER looking at the skies because uh, tornado sirens were going off. Wouldn't you know? Here I'm in the hospital, and they, the nurse screams, his temperature is 108 degrees. And I said, and I'm barely able to talk. My mouth is so dry. I said, get an IV in, in my arm. Now, he's telling the nurses. the nurses what to do because the doctors are all outside, outside looking, looking for at the, the tornadoes. Tornado warnings. <laughs> Saying, is there a tornado here? <laughs> so let me just tell you something. Don't be surprised when you're in the middle of a crisis and yeah. something's going on in your life. The devil will throw th- something at you to distract you mm-hmm. from what you're supposed to yes. be focusing on. And that's one of his tactics. So they so come in. So what happened? They come in. They do. They start an IV. And I said, no, start, two, start an IV in each arm. As soon as they put that IV in, this is amazing. She'll tell you. Literally, I started sweating, and it shot up about two inches, the perspiration, like little sprinklers going off all over my body. And it was absolutely amazing what yeah, it looked like. Yeah, because they had his shirt off, and so the pressure was so strong was so... from the heat that the minute the IV started going in his body, it looked like a sprinkler system. Water started squirting out of every pore, like two inches high. And it was the, it looked like something from Alfred Hitchcock. I mean, I was Alfred like, Hitchcock. whatever. <laughs> and I, I was sitting there. Now he begins, he begins talking about going through the valley of the shadow of death. He goes, he's mumbling this. I was and going in and out. I, I felt myself leaving my body. He did. Literally. And I'm standing over him, woman of God, full of faith and word. And I'm speaking over him. I said, you shall live and you shall not die. And I am declaring that over him because I knew the spirit of death was on him and that I was in a battle for his life. So I go and I call his mom and dad back in Mississippi, godly, God-fearing parents. Thank God for God-fearing parents. Amen. Amen. Yes. And I call them and I tell them what's going on to get the prayer chain going. So Amen. there at ORU in the prayer tower, they begin praying because he was very famous at that time on the campus. Everybody knew who he was. And so word spread through the campus that this guy was in crisis right now. So <laughs> prayers begin to go up. Now, what happened, church, is my legs were excruciating. Realize, if you've ever cooked a pot roast, anyone ever ever cooked? I haven't, but she has. Okay. But if you've ever cooked a pot roast, you know how that roast explodes in the oven? It gets so hot. That's what happened to my thighs, my muscles. My muscles literally blew up and they ruptured in my thighs. So the pain was excruciating. And then within a day, I started urinating coffee colored urine because the myoglobin in the muscle was going through my body and literally I had infarcted or destroyed, ruptured, just literally burst all the muscles in the quadriceps. And so for days I was urinating coffee urine, but thank goodness I had a nephrologist on and he saw that I was going into kidney failure. So he put me in, you know, PCU monitoring and he just put fluids through me, just round the clock, just high, high amounts of IV fluids. 
And I couldn't even walk. My legs were just in excruciating pain. And literally, I watched my legs shrivel up to where my arms were bigger than my legs. They shriveled up. I couldn't believe it. And then they, it, they stumped the doctors. They said, we've never seen this before. And they were calling around all over the U.S. We had some of the top, I had a top neurologist, top nephrologist, internal medicine doctor, and surgeon. And they said, we have got to biopsy your muscles in your legs and in your shoulders to see what's going on. We've never seen this before. And we said, you can do my leg, one leg, one leg only, but not my shoulder. It's, I don't have any damage there. They, so the doctor did. The surgeon came in my room. He biopsied my leg. He literally did it in my, in my uh, room, in my hospital room. I didn't go into surgery. He just did it right there. He went all the way, the whole muscle, all the way to the bone and biopsied the muscle, took it out. And I was watching as my wife was just freaking out. She couldn't see it. She couldn't stand for it. Well, but anyway, then they took, they took your to pathology. Now, I'm out in the right. hall. They, they send this to my buddy, my teacher, who's the pathologist. Love, he was my favorite teacher at ORU, uh, Dr. Golian. And anyway, took it to him, and then he read the report, and it, see, they came back to my wife, and they said, he has muscle necrosis all the way to the bone. And by the way, he'll never walk again. He'll never walk. His muscles are dead. Necrosis means dead. Dead all the way to the bone and he'll never walk in. My wife says, well, listen, don't you dare go in there and tell him he'll never walk again. Don't you dare do it. just tell him he's got some battles, but don't say that. Well, what did they do? Okay, so I, I knew the power of words and the spoken words over people. Well, death and life, church, are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And uh, God is a spirit. And, and they that I worship knew. him will worship him in spirit and truth. Now, this is his third year of medical school. One of the toughest years, anybody who's been in med school knows, the third year is the toughest med school right. year. And this is his toughest year, and he has been hit. This was a demonic attack. I knew it. And now they're coming and telling me that they're going to go in and tell this 220-pound bodybuilder hunk of a man that he's going to be in a wheelchair the rest of his life, and he will never walk again. And I told him, I said, now listen, that's not for you to determine. Don't you speak that over him. You just tell him he's in a battle. They ignored me. They went in and told him anyway. And I have a hot, fiery temper. She's got a temper. Praise God for her temper. <laughs> it's a holy temper. <laughs> You can have that wrath of God come up in you, and you don't even know where it comes from. And I basically let them know their services were no longer needed. What she said is, no, I want a second opinion. When she did that, she actually, they said, you fired us when you did this. We're no longer the doctor. She was literally canceling out the words they've spoken over me. But when they did that... These were my professors. These are his medical professors. I was professors. on the hardest rotation in med school. Internal medicine is the hardest. And literally, the hardest teacher was my kidney doctor. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm not going to pass med school. He'll fail me. <laughs> now, he's, because he's I wasn't in class. I wasn't even, I was in the hospital. Now, for you husbands and wives out there, if you've ever had that discussion with your wife, our husband, we were having one in the hospital room because he was upset at me. He's like, oh my gosh, you fired my professors. You have destroyed my medical career. <laughs> you, and I'm like, I'm trying to save your life. And I'm upset and he's upset. What she did, thank God what she did because what she did in doing that, she canceled out the death that was spoken over me. She canceled it out. And, okay. and as we were having this disagreement, she uh, left the room, went uh, down the elevator, and... Okay, now I'm in the elevator going down, and I like to stress this to people because yeah. I want you to know something. Every single one of us, if you're living, is going to be faced with some bad news. All of us. Yes, everybody. Everybody is going to be hit at some mm. point in their life with bad news. And whatever is inside of you when you get hit is what will come out. Either cursing, blaming God, blaming wives, blaming husbands, blaming moms, blaming dads, 
Whatever's in you, when you get that squeeze, yeah. is what's gonna come out. But if the Word of God is in you, yeah. mm -hmm. if it's seeped inside of Amen. you, when you get hit, the Word of God's gonna come out. Now, when you get the Word of God, I don't care what's going on, you get a word from God, you and God become a majority. Amen. I get in the elevator and I'm coming down and I'm crying and he's upset and all of a sudden I hear, he shall run and not be weary, he shall walk and not faint. I got my word <laughs> from God. Now praise God, church. She comes back in that room and she says, man has spoken, but here's what I just heard the Holy Spirit tell me. You shall run and not be weary. You shall walk and not faint. And all of a sudden, literally, hope was kindled in my heart. And even though I couldn't walk, my legs were literally still shrinking and shriveling up, I, start, I believe God. Whose report are you going to believe? Now, they took me home in a wheelchair. The craziest thing about it is I lived in a second story apartment. And I had to use my arms. My arms were real big at that this time. Was there was grand were housing. There grand housing in the second story. But and I had to literally go up the stairs on the railings. <laughs> I would just kind of will myself up the, the stairs. And everybody, the school, the professors, everybody, Mary, y'all need to move downstairs. You let us move. He needs to start learning how to operate the wheelchair. And y'all don't need to be up there anymore. And I go, excuse me? God has spoken. <laughs> He's going to run and he is going to walk. And I had to stand against the forces that was being spoken over him continually. Because let me tell you something. When you get a word from God, don't you budge. Amen. You stand and you hold on to that word. Now, church, I was in this little apartment, second story. They were bringing me my, all my classwork, which was huge, a huge amount of work to do. So I was in there studying and working. But then every morning around 7.30, this one preacher came on the radio, and I love this preacher. His name was R.W. Shambach. And he used to always say, you don't have any problems. All you need is faith in God. And literally, he preached faith he preached action. You put action behind your faith. And one day, the Holy Spirit, as he had finished preaching, the Holy Spirit says, get up and walk. And literally, I got up. I started walking. It was just cruciating. I couldn't, couldn't walk that far, but I started. And literally, well, faith I, was birthed in me. I have to me. tell you, I came home from grocery shopping, and I walked in. And when I walked in, I, was, I had the, gar, you know, the groceries in my and he was standing up in the living room, standing, and sweat was pouring off of him. And I dropped the groceries <laughs> because, you know, you're believing God. And when, then, when you see it manifest in front of you, you know, everything in you gets excited. And he was standing there, and he says, Mary, the presence of God filled the room. And I heard the Lord say, get out of your bed and walk. Amen. Now... We went back to the hospital uh, about, what, a month after I got out. Right. And when we went to the hospital and I walked in, it was, tell them what you saw. Well, it was like a movie. When we went back into- Like Forrest the, Gump. The, just like Forrest Gump. <laughs> Love Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> Love Forrest Gump. We go back into the city of faith. Well, see, the nurses and the doctors all saw the pathology report. His legs were dead. Do you understand his muscles, the way they explained it to me, when a muscle dies, Mary, it doesn't come back to life. It begins to break down and atrophy. His legs will eventually be like a bone. There'll be no muscle there. Do you understand? His legs are dead. So they saw the pathology report. They knew his legs were dead. We're walking into the hospital. He's walking into the hospital. The doctors and the nurses began pouring out. You could see the look on their face to see him walking. So they bring him in and they take this measuring tape to measure his thighs. And his legs were an inch bigger than they were before the heat stroke. Now, church... 
Oral Roberts, Abundant Life, did an article on me in the Abundant Life magazine. And then that next year, this is when they did the article on me, and then I decided to go. We decided, we prayed, and God says, you're going to do your residency in Orlando, Florida. And I said, because great light will come out of Orlando. And so we said, praise God. So I went ahead and selected Orlando as my number one choice. And is a Seventh-day Adventist hospital, which are, they are Christians, okay? <laughs> they just worship on the uh, Saturday instead of Sunday, but they're, they're Christians, similar to Baptists, God-fearing, amen. But anyway, what happened is we moved to Orlando, and we didn't know a soul there. I didn't know anyone there. But one day, I, went, I always go to the gym, so I went to this gym and, uh, near the hospital, right next to the hospital. It's called Orange Avenue Gym. And I'm in there, and I got this T-shirt on that has this bodybuilder on it with his arms like this that says, praise the Lord. (laughs) And so this guy comes up to me and says, you're a Christian, huh? And I said, yeah. He says, where do you go to church? I says, I'm not found a good church here. Do you know where a good church is? He said, I know where a really good church is. He says, it's right down here in Gore Street, which is downtown. He says, there's a new church there. It's a small little church, about 200 people. He says, the guy, you can barely understand him, but he's real anointed. And so that Sunday we went there, and I, here I am in my shorts. We have our one-year-old son. Four months old. Actually, four months old, right. Four-month-old son. We're sitting on the back row in this church. And then all of a sudden, we hear the preacher from the altar point his finger and say, are you that doctor that Oral Roberts wrote about in Abundant Life magazine? Talking about a divine appointment, he had me stand up come up to the front, and I was in shorts and a t-shirt, and there's my wife holding our four-month-old son, and he had his guest speaker there, Reinhardt Bonnke, (laughs) and this was Benny Hinn, and Benny Hinn says, I read about your miracle. Well, from that day in 1984, we have been... Well, he announced that night. Yeah. He announced that night to the... This is my doctor. This is my doctor. (laughs) God sent him to me. He didn't even really know us. (laughs) Benny and I have gone, Benny especially, and as part of his healing team, we have traveled all over the world in his healing meetings, literally experiencing the power of God, setting people free. The power in those, those meetings are so, the anointing is so tangible. You literally, when some people literally will touch, uh, near where Benny is, it's like they've touched a high power line. But literally, Benny is still one of our dearest friends. He was just in my office yesterday, not just coming by to pick up some supplements, but we go. The reason is, the reason is, and this is important, is that Benny, Pastor Benny, out of respect, in case you're watching, I wouldn't be surprised. We love Benny. We love Pastor Benny. (laughs) I call him Benny. Pastor, but he's (laughs) Pastor (laughs) Benny. Okay. He, he, he was, he, he's so aware, he is so aware of the miracles of God. And folks, we have seen up front, we were the, part of the healing team going out into the crowds. We have seen it all. I don't care what it is, we've seen it all. So nothing surprises us anymore. But God knew this little fella was gonna take the healing message of Jesus Christ around the world, but that he needed a doctor by his side right who not only believed in miracles, but had personally experienced one. So it was nothing for this man of God to believe for your miracle, because he knows the miracle working God. And Pastor Benny recognized that the natural is just as important as the spiritual. Doing the natural things, what you can do, God will not do. Ouch. What you can do, he will not do. But what is beyond your reach and what you aren't able to do, that's, what God, that's where your faith and with God, all things are possible. Do you understand that? That's an important part of your healing. <clears throat> you having done all. Well, have you done all? What all does that mean? That's where this man of God comes into play. And that's why he's written so many books. 
to bring. He was on a show with Pastor Benny. Can I tell him real quick? Sure. He was on a show with Pastor Benny after several years of traveling and their doctor and their family. And he was on a program with him one day. And Pastor Benny turned and went, Doctor. Now, this is in the early 1990s, church. <laughs> okay. Do a little booklet for my partners <laughs> and tell them all the secrets of health that you know and you share with me. And share. Oh. Would you do it for my partners? And Dom was like, I've never written a book on live TV. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so Don gets off and he comes home and he's like, this talk is about stress. <laughs> so he comes home, and we've lived some stressful moments. That's why we're up here. And so he, go, he comes home, and he goes, Mary, I've never written a book. What has he done? What has he done? I don't know how to write a book. So He, he went, sent us into stress mode. Stress mode. But what happened, church? I said, okay, Benny, let me just teach at the church. I'm going to put it in my words. What are some of the keys? And, and it, it was called Walking in Divine Health. And Benny sold how many books, would you say? He's, he sold, within 30 days, 25,000 books. So he comes to our house after a month and goes, Doctor, I've sold 25,000 books. I need that book. <laughs> there was no book. He goes, people are going to be calling and wanting that book. He forced me out of my comfort zone. I had no desire to write any books, but God had a different desire for me. That's how God okay. works. He will stretch you. He will stretch you, church. Get ready. To areas ready. that you can't even you imagine stretched. you would ever do. And you have to just be obedient and submissive Amen. and just be stretched. Amen. But church. I got to tell him this okay. real quick. I know you came to hear him. I'm trying to shut up. But what happened is with this book, Pastor Benny made several million dollars from donations off this book. And he came to Don and he goes, Doc, he goes, I think you should get something for this book. And Don goes, no, no, Pastor. That's for the ministry. That's for you. No, I, no, but tell I can't what touch he did. that. Because he was pressed for time. Oh, I will. Okay. Okay. No, you got to tell that. She's gotta, the best storyteller. You got to tell about he printed the book without me proofing the book. Okay. That's and right. And had all these typos, and I said, oh, my god!" Because what gosh. they did is they transcribed it from him talking. Yes. So they transcribed the book into talking. And I said, oh, my goodness. It They're going to read this book and think, reading. think this poor doctor doesn't know anything. <laughs> now, his exact words were, when he got the book and they brought it to him, and he goes, what is this? And they go, this is your book. He goes, but I, but I, I haven't proof proofed it. it. I haven't looked at it. And they go, well, we didn't have time. We didn't have time. <laughs> Pastor Benny said, print it. Just print it. That Don, was a very humbling experience. <laughs> okay. So Don opens up the book and he looks and he's reading. He goes, oh my God, my colleagues are going to think I'm retarded. <laughs> <laughs> You, you can't can, get that first book anywhere, I don't humble. think. Well, you may be able to. <laughs> Listen, if you don't stay humble, <laughs> That's right. God will humble and you. And he did. And <laughs> so, it was so, what, so, this is an amazing story. This is an amazing story. I'm telling you, it's awesome. Don took no money for it, mainly because he thought everybody thought he was retarded. So that's one reason. <laughs> but Benny made several million, right? Little did we know that was our first fruits Amen. of an offering. We took nothing for the first mm -hmm. book he ever printed. And today he's written over 50 books, three New York Times. Every book he's ever written has made number one Amazon bestseller. And every language all over the world. And it came out of first fruits. Do you hear that? It's an important point. Now, church... Tonight, we're going to be talking about overcoming stress. That was our introduction. That's introduction, yeah. That's a long introduction. <laughs> okay. Are y'all here? <laughs> now, Just get your God, pillows this... and blankets, because we're here. Did y'all notice one thing? I noticed your intercessor, Renee. Did you see how she is full of the spirit of joy? You see how we're to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, you see in his presence there is fullness of joy. 
Church, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, and all things give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You want to know the will of God concerning you? And all things give thanks. We're to rejoice always. Now again, mo mo most Christians can't do it because they have stress. Stress is literally robbing them of their joy. Now listen to what Americans st are stressed about. These are your main stresses here in America. I just got this off. According to a new poll from the American Psychological Association, a large majority of Americans are reporting high stress levels due to number one, financial concerns, finances. Well, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Again, we, all we have to do is just cast our cares onto him and just receive it and then get out and ask for it. It'll happen. Doors will open. Number two is uh, financial concerns about really groceries, gas, electricity. Number two is inflation. Prices are going up, but there's no inflation with God. He'll supply all your needs, church. And number three is the COVID-19 pandemic. That is a nothing now. And again, no plague will befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. We don't have to worry about a plague. Don and I travel every two weeks to go to Orlando and then back to Dallas. Every two weeks. We've been doing this for eight years. On top of being on planes, traveling and speaking and doing TV, throughout the whole pandemic, never missed a lick. Neither one of us ever got COVID. And we've been in front of hundreds and thousands of people. Amen. Never even got the flu. Not a sniffle, not a cough. God has divinely protected us. Why? Because we, in the beginning of this, took a, we took a um, salvation cup. What is it? Communion, oh, communion. cup. We took <laughs> communion. What are you saying? We took communion. <laughs> no, and we not put the shot. The, <laughs> we took the blood and put it over our doorpost. Amen. And we declared no weapon formed against us will prosper. No plague Amen. shall come nigh our dwelling. And we've got two sons Amen. and seven grandchildren, and nobody got COVID. None. Number four stress, None. church. Number four stress is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, according to stress in America, these are the main things. 81 stresses. 81% of Americans are stressed out due to supply chain issues. 87% are stressed due to rising inflation in the US. 80% from possible Russian cyber attacks or nuclear threats to the US. 69% are worried that World War III could break out anytime. And number five, 65% are stressed out about money and the economy. Well, Jesus said, in John 16, 33, in this world, you'll have tribulation, but be a good cheer. I've overcome the world. The next day, he was literally arrested and then crucified, church. But he said, hey, be a good cheer. We are to, supposed to go through this life in joy, but unfortunately, most of us can't because the stress response is going out and we can't enter joy. We're think, supposed to be living is, out of our spirit and have the fruit of the spirit. That is such a good point, Don, because literally in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's standing there talking to his disciples and says, okay, guys, let not your heart be troubled like within the next few minutes. Think about that. Let not your heart be troubled. That is an important message from Jesus to every one of you. Let not your heart be troubled. Yeah. Amen. Okay, now let me tell you how we're hardwired for stress. This happens to everyone. So I'm going to paint the picture of how our body naturally responds to stress. Back in 1936, Hans Selye was the father of stress, and I want to make sure I got that date, date right. And it was 1936. Hans Selye was a doctor, an endocrinologist from Canada. And what he was trying to do is he was trying to find the next new ovarian hormone. So he what he did is he tested these rats with an ovarian extract. He injected the rats with the extract. But he was a very clumsy investigator. So he chased the rats around his lab 
Many would get in under um, a cabinet or somewhere, so he'd take a broom handle and try and poke at the rat to get it out from under the table, and he stressed these little rats like crazy. Then after a while, he autopsied the rats. He said, a weird thing happened. Number one, they have enlarged adrenal glands. Number two, they have ulcer. Many of them had ulcers. Enlarged, many of them had enlarged adrenal glands, and many of them had shrunken thymus glands. Now, the thymus gland is a major gland of immunity, and we need the thymus gland to, for our immune system, especially in protection against viruses, bacteria, and cancer. So he said, I'll repeat the experiment with tighter controls. So he took the same ovarian extract, and he separated the rats into two groups. One, he gave the ovarian extract. The second group, he gave saline, which is just salt water. So he injected in these rats. He was still a clumsy investigator. He dropped the rats. He chased them all over the lab and stressed the poor little critters literally to death. And then when he autopsied them again, both groups had the same thing. They had the shrunk, most of them had the shrunken thymus glands. Their immune system was shot. They had enlarged adrenal glands. Their little adrenal glands were like the passing gear in the car. And it literally was like the passing gear got burnt out. And then they developed, many developed ulcers. So he called this the general adaptation syndrome to stress. And he found out that animals as well as humans go through three major phases of stress. The first phase is the alarm stage. This is the fight or flight reaction. This is where God has put into us the most amazing chemical called Adrenaline. Has anyone had a shot of adrenaline, especially when you have been in an accident and all of a sudden this fight or flight goes off or you've been attacked by an animal? Like one time, I got to tell you this funny story. I had, okay, in my garage, I'd open the garage because I had a cat and I'd let that cat come in the garage. But one day, uh, a mountain lion or yeah, a lion, a mountain lion ate the cat. So we closed the garage. One day, the cleaning lady came over. She was cleaning out her garage. And I had put a little cat house in there. And so she, there was a little uh, padded cat house. And I was in my garage sitting up on this little cat tower that I had. We'd go and scratch its top paws and all. Well, she picked it up, and it was heavy. And all of a sudden, she dumps it out, and there's a possum that had come into the garage and was living in that cat house. It scared her like crazy. And she throws that thing down and then gets a broom and chases it out. But again, that's because that possum literally was in that house, and he had found a home. <laughs> and so what and I'm that, saying... And that possum, what, he, what he's going to is that possum hissed at her. Oh, and... <laughs> <laughs> and when, it, when he and hissed, she, the reaction yeah. went off, and literally she screamed, and she took so that her broom and started fighting. She got started completely stuck. Well, she got she got stuck, and she was literally having dreams of that possum attacking her, yeah. and it stressed her out. Her and alarm he, and system. And Dr. Colbert thinks that's funny. Well, I was laughing because I could see that silly possum hissing at her, and her getting so stressed, and then running, and then coming back with a broom and chasing the thing out of the garage because he knew that we didn't want to go home and have a possum in our garage. So that stimulated the stress response, adrenaline. Now here's what happens: when this a powerful hormone is released in the body, the heart beats real fast. And the blood pressure increases in order to get blood to the muscles and to the brain. Blood is shunted away from the digestive tract so we don't digest our food good. And it's shunted away from the skin so our skin gets cold and clammy. Also, our pupils dilate so we can see very good. Our brain becomes very focused. Fats and sugars are dumped in the bloodstream so that we can fight or flee. That's what happens. But what happens is when we get stuck in the stress response, we start having palpitations, rapid heartbeats, high blood pressure, gut problems because blood is shunted away from the gut to the muscles. We start getting muscle spasms. We're wondering why we get fibromyalgia, muscle cramps all throughout our body and our back because the stress response is stuck on alarm stage. We're in alarm mode. 
For example, panic attacks, anxiety, that's just this natural survival instinct God has put in us. We're all hardwired that way, but we get stuck on it because we literally get stuck on thinking, thinking of what could happen to me. What if this happens? What if that happens? Worst case scenario thinking. And it literally causes us to get stuck in our own stress Jesus that are meant to save our lives by fighting or fleeing, but we start to stew in on stress Jesus and it causes disease. Do you see what I'm happening? An example is a pit bull attack that happened about 20 years ago. We, I had sent my wife and my son and my nephew over to um, a friend's house because my son had taken the paddle boat and had paddled it across the lake to a friend's house and he left it there. So we had to go retrieve the paddle boat. So what happened, they take the truck and they go over there, and then all of a sudden, when they get out of the truck, there's a pit bull on the second floor balcony. He jumps off the balcony and starts chasing my son, who's about 19, 18 or 19 at that time. Well, my son's fast. He runs and he jumps in the lake. Well, the dog runs and jumps in the lake too and, ch- and starts paddling and barking. And finally, the dog gets frustrated because my son takes his shoe off and pops him on the head a few times, and he drinks some water, and he turns around and paddles back, and there's my nephew, and he's saying, come on, come on, and he see, he loves animals, he had had pit bulls, so he said, oh, I can befriend this dog. Not so. So here he's calling the dog, and then the dog all of a sudden goes and romping in full attack mode, and then all of a sudden my nephew goes into attack mode too. And Mary's on a hill over here crying, Danny, don't look at him in the face. Well, Danny said, if I take my eyes off on him, he's going to bite me. And finally, he lunges and grabs his legs, one of his legs, and he grabs a chunk out of the jeans and just a minor flesh wound. But then Mary's screaming even louder. And then all of a sudden, the pit bull turns and fastens his eyes on Mary. And then here he comes after Mary. Well, what happened is I had watched the Discovery Channel. (laughs) <laughs> and on the Discovery Channel, they talked about what to do in the event of an attacking dog. And the man, the first thing he said is, whatever you do, avoid eye contact. Don't make eye contact. They view that as aggression. The second thing you do not do is try to outrun him, which my son had done. <laughs> that invigorates him. And then the, the last thing he said is, and whatever you do in avoiding the eye contact, bring your limbs in and don't let him breathe frailing, which is what Danny was doing, <laughs> trying to hit it with his thing. Bring them in so that there's nothing swinging around that they can grab a hold of. So now the dog, I'm thinking this in my head, is the dog is coming toward me at full force. And all I could think is, Oh my God, I hope this man knew what he was talking about. Because I've just witnessed, you know, my nephew's leg. Because what they do is they attack the leg to get you on the ground to go for your throat. That's the whole plan. So I turned my back to this raging dog coming up the hill. And I brought my arms in just like that. And this dog is coming up the hill at me, full force, 100 pound pit bull. So I'm standing and all of a sudden he comes to the left of me and I can see him and I turn and now he and I are spinning. He's trying, he's trying his best to get eye contact with me and I thought, "Uh uh-uh, not me. You ain't seeing these eyes. So... By the time we're spinning and making the dog, dog's probably like, what the heck? You know? So he goes running back down the hill to go back to the more fun person who's my nephew. But luckily by then, police had been called. The owner of the house jumped on top of him by this time, and the dog was taken down. Now, they all come to my office, they get in the truck, and my son drives them all to my office, and here my son and nephew are laughing and joking and saying, can you believe that? That thing grabbed my, you know, jeans and tore a hole in my jeans, but just a little flesh wounds, just put him in a little antibiotic, he didn't need any stitches or anything. They were just laughing and cutting up, but here's my wife, 
Her shoulders were like this. Her fists were clenched. She was reliving the attack. And I said, Mary, relax. Her blood pressure was a little high. Her heart rate was a I little high. I almost got eaten by a pit bull. Yes, what do you she mean? she was saying, I almost died. That thing could have killed me. And so luckily, church, the next week, we, were, we went on a cruise in the Caribbean, and we laughed, and we relaxed. And she literally, I saw her fist. Every day at first, the fists were clenched. She was reliving the attack. Her shoulders, she'd walk around like this. I said, Mary, why are your shoulders almost touching your ears? Uh, because she was so stressed and tense thinking of the but, near dog attack. But or let the, me tell you what the Holy Spirit did. And this is for anyone who's ever been carjacked, almost raped, you've almost had some sort of tragic event happen in your life and you've come close. What the Holy Spirit had took me is I had to reframe it. It almost happened. She, let me explain. She went down the what if and She went down the what if and thought pattern and the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is seeing the worst possible outcome which is losing an arm or losing a leg or going for the jugular vein or the carotid arteries and bleeding out. So literally, she was reliving the attack and what if it? And so I said, and so we were talking. We said, Mary, can you believe how the angels watched over you and protected you and how you received that report from the, what, Nat Geo or whatever channel you were watching before this attack, I wouldn't have known what to do. But she literally got this report. She knew what to do. She carried it out perfectly. And the angels of God watched over her. She reframed it, and her whole body relaxed, church. She experienced the peace of God. And that's what he wants to do to you. He wants to get rid of these ungodly carnal emotions and put in the godly spirit emotions of walking in the spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. It's not stress. Stress is a carnal emotion, and you can't receive the peace of God when you're stuck in stress mode. So the next phase, after the alarm phase, is the resistance stage. This is when you've been in, in stress for a while. Chronic disease, chronic pain, chronic injury, depression, anxiety, a bad marriage, no way out. Then all of a sudden, God has put this other hormone called cortisol in our bodies that when we are experiencing disease, famine, or pestilence, or just bad times, in order for us to survive, this other stress hormone starts to rise, and it's called cortisol. Now, cortisol is a double-edged sword. Short-term, it's great. Cortisol is one of the best anti-inflammatories known to man. In the ER, they use it all the time. You got a rash, you got poison ivy, boom, they give you a shot of cortisone, and it goes away because it's a powerful anti-inflammatory. But cortisol, long-term, is a major problem. The way our body's designed is we, our bodies produce cortisol in a diurnal rhythm. And this happens with most people. In other words, at around 8 a.m., cortisol levels rise to the highest point usually, which wakes us up, gives us energy so we can go through the day. Then around midnight, it drops to the lowest. So at 8 is the highest, at midnight is the lowest, so we can go into a deep, refreshing sleep. But what happens when it's always high? When it's always high, all of a sudden, your body starts to gain belly fat. And cortisol causes belly fat. Uh, high cortisol, where you lose that diurnal rhythm, starts to also elevate your blood pressure. The blood pressure rises. It just so happens that over 40% of adults have obesity in this country. 40%. Why? They are stuck in the resistant stage of stress. They are not experiencing the peace of God that passes all understanding. They're stuck in the resistant with high cortisol levels, and they run to their doctor, and they're getting medicine for obesity. Their blood pressure is high. Approximately 42% of adults have high blood pressure, which is, I mean, absolutely amazing. 42%. Prediabetes and diabetes. Over 40% of adults have either prediabetes or diabetes. Why? Because cortisol raises the blood sugar. High cortisol raises your blood sugar. It also raises your cholesterol and your triglycerides. It also weakens your immune system. It also will weaken your bones and cause osteopenia in women and men and osteoporosis. 
It also lowers your sex hormones. In men, it lowers your testosterone. In women, it lowers your progesterone. It lowers your DHEA. And it literally makes your body like an old man and an old woman. You start to age rapidly. It causes memory loss. High cortisol causes memory loss. It also causes, it can contribute to depression by causing imbalance of neurotransmitters. It also causes decreased immune function. High cortisol is associated with the lowering of the natural killer cells. The natural killer cells are a component of our immune system that kills viruses, bacteria, and cancer cells. When you decide to stay in the resistance stage of stress by unremitting stress and not giving your cares to the Lord, not learning how to cast your cares off, you are literally setting yourself up for every disease under the sun. Now, if, it, if you continue in this resistance stage, it leads to the third stage, the exhaustion stage. That's where cortisol that was once high drops, and then you don't have enough cortisol. Here's what happens when they're in the uh, last stage, or which is the exhaustion stage. Your body runs out of cortisol. You don't have enough cortisol, so you start to get really tired. Sleep is affected. You can't sleep, and you're exhausted. Talking about a problem, these patients I see every day in my practice. They come in, they're exhausted, they can't sleep, their gut's a mess, they're sensitive or allergic to most of their foods. Uh, they have all kinds of muscle aches and pains usually. Their memory's uh, poor. They're prone to be depressed. They get recurrent infections because their immune system's shot just like the rats. Remember, their adrenals are affected. Their thymuses or immune system are affected and their gut's affected. And this is what happens. These people are eventually burnt out mentally, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. And literally every disease, it's an open door for every disease. That's when autoimmune disease comes in. That's when depression comes in. That's when cancer comes in. That's where chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia comes in. You've heard of all these diseases. You come against them. It's a stuck stress response when people are stuck in the exhaustion stage of stress. And these people, the one thing they always say, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm so tired. I have no energy. I have, I'm not able to sleep. They literally are absolutely miserable. And every, most every doctor will give them a pill and it doesn't work. It doesn't get to the root. They need a gospel. They need the spirit of the fruit. They need the, the fruit of the spirit infused into them. They need literally the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace. They need to experience the peace of God. See, you can't have stress if you're walking in the peace of God. That is the key. Now, I literally went through this. I went through this back in 1990. I was so tired in 1990. You see, I was in solo practice. I'd been in practice, solo practice for over three years, and I woke up one day, and I had this rash. And I said, oh my goodness, maybe I contracted scabies from a patient. It's like crazy. And so I went and put some of this medicine on me and washed it off after a certain amount of time, and the rash was worse. So finally, I went and saw my friend, who's one of the leading dermatologists, and I said, Jerry, what is going on? And he looked at me, and he had his glasses down, and he shook his head, and he said, sorry, Don, you have the heartbreak. I remember the words heartbreak. You have the heartbreak of psoriasis. I said, that's impossible. No one in my family has psoriasis. He said, sorry, you got it. So he gave me, ripped out of script, and said, take this coal tar with aqua for aqua. Now listen to the treatment. This is what was the treatment. It was literally coal tar, what they put on roofs of buildings. You know, the black tar with this was orange. It stunk like, literally, they were tarring a road, okay? And it turned everything yellow. My sheets yellow, my pillow yellow, the, the seats on my car yellow, everything yellow. And when I walked into an exam room, they would, everyone would say, whoa, what's that smell? I said, it's me, it's my coal tar. And then finally they'd say, Dr. Cobra, what's that rash you have? See, I was covered with this rash. It was on my arms, on my elbows, on my knees, on my thighs, and I itched like crazy. Mary would call me scratchy and itchy, right? But what happened is I was, I, I was stuck in the exhaustion stage of stress. You see, I was working day and night. I was on call. I didn't, take, I didn't share call because doctors didn't like other doctors in solo practice. So they kind of said, no, we're gonna, not going to let you in our call group. You're going to take call. So finally, I got to the point where I quit doing hospital because I had to decide it's my health. So I started literally 
getting my house in order and getting back in God's rhythm. Church, say God's rhythm. You see, God's got a rhythm. And I was almost always running ahead of God. When I got sick, I didn't rest. I went in my cabinet at my office. We had tons of antibiotics. The drug reps would come. I had the strongest antibiotics. I'd take them for a week or a week and a half. Boom, knock it out. I wouldn't rest my body. I wouldn't get to the root. And finally, I decimated my gut. The Holy Spirit showed me, and that's why I've been able to help so many people because I was a mess. I was stuck in this exhaustion stage of stress. I literally, I was out of cortisol. My adrenals were shot. I was just like that rat stuck in the exhaustion stage of stress where all these diseases were coming upon me. I had to rest my body. I had to get in the spirit and out of my flesh, sleep. I had to restore my gut with probiotics. I had to eat living foods and literally clear the food sensitivities. And within a couple of years, it was all gone, and it's been gone to this day. And church, finding these answers, I've written books on all this. That's how I know, because literally these diseases I've been through, I'm on the other side of this, but the root problem is stress. And what you need to know is I do not care. I do not care what you have, what you're battling with in your health. God has an answer for every disease. Every disease, God has an answer. Sometimes it's a miracle, and we've seen them, and we believe it. And sometimes it requires just that, a miracle, and we understand that. But sometimes it will require you to do something. You have to do something. You've got to be willing to walk in the Spirit. Now, I'm going to say something here, and I know right now, before I say it, some of you are not going to like what I'm going to tell you. But you need to hear it. Most Christians are carnally led. They are not led by the Spirit. They're led by what they think, what they believe, what they've been influenced to do by friends, family, social, TV. And as a result, we have a very carnal church in America, a very carnally led church in America. It's all about what I think instead of submitting to the Spirit of God and hearing what does he think. When you are Spirit-led, I can come out there to each one of you and I can come to your home and I can talk to you and I can take a look at what's in your garden as to what you've been planting. What have you been planting in your garden? Because what comes up is what you've been planning. So I can see how you're led. Spirit-led? Are you carnally led? By looking at your garden. Because if you have Christ in you, and you've asked Jesus into your heart, and you are full of the Holy Ghost, the only thing that you need to begin to work on is crucifying that flesh and the carnal nature of you and submitting to what his word says and submitting to the spirit of God. Let me tell you a secret for me. I've been walking with him now 45 years. At the age of 21, I got radically saved and spirit fell. And I want you to know this is my secret and I'm gonna share it with you every day. Every day, I pray to the Father. Father, I thank you that my footsteps have been ordered by you. I thank you, Father, for connecting me with people I should be connected to. Remove those from my life who do not belong. I pray that every day. And the divine connections that God brings me in do you know when Jesus got up early in the morning and spent time, I feel the presence of God all of us. I feel him Amen. all over me right now. Amen. When Jesus would get up, he'd get up early before the sun arises. And if you'll notice, there's a presence across the earth that when the sun comes up, it leaves. 
If you want to know why, go back and look in Genesis. It says, when it was out walking in the cool of the day, looking for Adam and Eve. My God changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's up every morning early looking for his Adam and Eve, who he can converse with, who he can talk to, who he can reveal himself with, whom he can in in increase your knowledge of understanding of what he wants to do through you. He wants spirit-led people. Amen. He wants people who obey him and aren't led by the carnal flesh. That is an important time right now, church. We're headed into a time that is going to be very dark. I, he's already told me. Mary, prepare. You're headed into some dark times. It's important that my church hear my voice and they obey me. It's a very important time. And those that are led carnally are going to be the ones who suffer. Those are going to be the ones whose oil will begin to roll dry. The murmurers, the complainers, the fault finders, the slanderers, the accusers of the brethren, angry at God. We're going to see that happen. And God is looking for a church. He's looking for a people who is spirit-led, not by your carnal flesh. And when you hear him say, go here, go, and go then. And if he says, don't you go there, don't you go there. It is a time of obedience, church. If he says, give this, let it go. Give it. But don't, you don't, you're not moved by giving because someone makes you feel guilty. Because then you are on the short end of the stick. Jesus didn't do anything that the Father didn't tell him to do. Think about that. What my Father tells me to do, I do. Amen. Jesus, we can't be any different. We've got to be a people that when the Holy Spirit says, do this, we do it. And if he says, don't do it, you better not do it. There's consequences to it. There's always consequences. Yeah, he'll forgive you. Yeah, he'll recalculate. Yeah, he'll redirect you. But many times it will come with a price. The lack of obedience and obeying him will come with a price. And it's important that we, church, lay down our carnal flesh thinking and become obedient body of Christ. I can look around as we go to churches. Mm -hmm. I can look around and I can see how people are carnally led. They'll tattoo their bodies all up because that's the culture. That's used as a good draw is a witness that's flesh that is flesh now I'm not condemning anybody who's got tattoos but I have seen Christians go and get tattoos because they want to be a witness that's flesh that's being carnally led now if you have them God will use them he'll use them now <laughs> He will. He'll use them. So he opens a door for witnesses. We were on a plane today, and Don's sitting there in his short sleeve, and this guy sitting next to him covered in tattoos. We don't have any. <laughs> but the presence of God is on him. Nothing in the flesh. Just the presence and the presence of God. This guy reaches over the aisle. He couldn't quit talking to Don. Who are you? He says. Who are you? I never said anything to him until we're on the plane. I'm, I'm laughing. I'm going, God, you're so good. Because in the flesh, there was no reason why this man would be drawn. Amen. It was the spirit. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you become spirit-led... You're spirit-led, and you're not going to be carnally led. 
Because carnal, remember, to live a life that's carnally led is death. Yes, amen. But to be led by the Spirit, it's life. And peace. That's where peace. his life is. But again, church, we have to let the Spirit of God dwell in our hearts and let peace guard, rule your heart. Peace, that's Colossians 3.15. Let peace rule, rule there means umpire. And we have lost as a church one of the greatest navigational tools of the Holy Spirit, which is peace. You are to be led by peace, not by stress, not by worry, not by fretting, or simply the peace of God. And when you're led by peace, you will almost always, you will always make the right decision. Now again, the Word of God teaches us in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 to be anxious about nothing. In other words, it says, don't worry about anything, but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. You got to put the thanksgiving in there. Let your request be made unto God. And then the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard Guard means to literally guard like by military your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Well, he tells us in Isaiah 26, 3, thou wilt keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me because you trust in me. So again, church, let peace be your guide. Let peace literally guide you. That's one of the greatest way God leads us is through peace. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And again, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Now, again, one thing Paul said that was real important in Philippians 3, verse 13, he says, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth to those things that are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Too many Christians are remembering offenses. Someone done me wrong song. Offenses literally invite every kind of evil work into your life, into your body, even all kinds of illness. It literally causes the stress response to get stuck in the alarm stage or the resistance stage and eventually the exhaustion stage where literally you attract every disease into your body. So what is an offense? Offense is simply any circumstance perceived as unjust. Someone hurt me. Someone rejected me. Someone betrayed me. Someone uh, did me someone wrong song. That's all an offense is. Paul said in Acts 24, verse 16, he says, I exercise myself to always have a conscience free of offense toward God and toward man. It's like an exercise. He had to exercise, like going to the gym and working out with weights. He exercised himself to have a conscience free of offense toward God and toward man. You see, a lot of people come to my office and they're sick and they're stuck in this exhaustion stage or resistance stage of stress where literally they've invited every disease into their body because they're, they're not living in peace because they have a fence. And when they have a fence, you literally attract in and invite in the tormentors or torturers, according to Matthew chapter 18. And if you've read the story of the, the king who wanted to settle his accounts, and so the king, he uh, brings the two servants that owe money. And, and one, okay, she says finish this, 930, okay. Well, okay, one owed 10,000 talents. Let me tell you how much 10,000 talents is. One talent is equal to 60,000 denaria. Denaria, one, t one owed 10,000 talents. One talent, 66,000 denaria, but 10,000 talents is 60,000 uh, days of work. One denaria is one day of work. So in other words, a denaria is a day's wage. 10,000 talents would equal 60 million denaria or 160,000 years to pay. 160,000 years. That's ridiculous. That's an unpayable debt. But what happened? The king forgives the one guy who owes an unpayable debt. He couldn't pay it back. But this guy goes out 
and he gets a servant who owes him just 100 denarii, which is a little over three months' work. He has him thrown into prison. Well, word gets back to the king, and so here's what the king does. So let me pick this up. This is in Matthew chapter 18. And you gotta hear this, church, because I see this almost every day in my practice, because you invite in the, tor the tormentors or the torturers. And here it says, the master was very angry and delivered him to the torturers or tormentors until he should pay all that was to him. So, here it is in verse 35. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Again, if we don't forgive, we're inviting in the tortures or torments. Now, who are they? Who are the tortures? Torment? Well, disease. I've had lots of patients who didn't forgive, and they literally, many developed cancer, many developed arthritis, many developed autoimmune disease, many developed depression or anxiety and no peace and no sleep. That's tor tormentors or tortures, but also demonic spirits. They're the tormentors. They're the tortures. They give you no peace no rest, and they literally make the offense get worse and worse. Your offense starts to spread to others, and it's a someone done me wrong song. And so what the Word of God says, we've got to resist offense. We've got to exercise ourselves to be free of offense. Listen to what Hebrews 12, 15 says. It says, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grow up to trouble you, corrupting many. You see, bitterness and resentment is contagious. It spreads to others. It corrupts many others. The word offense in the Bible comes from the Greek word that means bait. And is used as how they would catch an animal. See, the bait would lure the animal into the trap. And the devil is offering you your, his bait of offense. And he's saying, hey, get angry with him. Get even. Give them a piece of your mind. Come on. Take the bait. Drink the poison. Drink it all up. You see, our bodies are not meant to harbor a fence. It destroys the vessel it's in. It's like putting hydrochloric acid in a styrofoam cup. It destroys the container, and you, church, are the container. It sets you into the alarm stage of stress, the resistance stage of stress, or the worst stage of stress is the exhaustion stage of stress, where your body literally starts to, everything starts to go haywire. Your immune system goes haywire. These, the hormones go, are gone. You can't sleep. You're exhausted. You can't think. And literally, your immune system gets so weak, cancer invades your body. And this is how I see so many patients. Wonderful Christians who are once loving are literally filled with offense and hatred and bitterness and it's a progression, as Matthew 24 tells us. In the last days, it says, many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. It leads to hate. And hate invites in all of those tormentors. And so many Christians cannot experience the fruit of the Spirit. They're stuck in offense. Church, we have to release the offense. Now, we, now again, the offense, it's real simple. John the Baptist got offended. And it cost him his head, church. You remember when John the Baptist sent two of his disciples, Jesus said, are you he or we look for another? And so Jesus went and performed all of these miracles. And then he says, he says, among those born of women, there was none greater than John the Baptist. But he says, go tell John all that you've seen. And by the way, tell him uh, that, you know, he got offended and because he was offended, I believe it cost him his head. Now, again, that's what we see all the time. People get stuck in offense. They come to me, and when they're stuck in offense, they literally unleash that stress response. The very stress response meant to save your life begins to destroy your life, just like that acid in that styrofoam cup. It's not meant to carry that. Now, again, what do you do when you have offense? We have to release it. We have to give it to the Lord. And Jesus is clear on what he says when he says when we have offense. In Ephesians 4, 31, 32, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Jesus Christ has forgiven you. The same way God forgave you, we are to forgive others. What does it mean to forgive? 
is simply cancel the debt. That's all that the king did. He canceled the debt. Church, but you say, but someone hurt me. Someone stressed me. Someone destroyed my name. Someone betrayed me. They rejected me. They abandoned me. They sexually abused me. Church, if you don't forgive, literally, you are inviting in the tormentors. You have to forgive so that you can walk in the Spirit. So many people can't walk in the Spirit because they're not forgiving. And we do this almost every day in my practice. We've been doing this for 25 to 30 years. We take patients through forgiveness therapy. I just had a patient there two days ago, two women, who literally, as soon as I did it, and I found the offense, as soon as I found the offense, literally, they started weeping, and then all of a sudden, the spirit, they started uh, screaming. Spirits came out of them. And you could see the demons. The demons came out and freaked the husband out. First time I'd seen this woman. And the spirits came out, and they couldn't believe it. See, I cannot believe my wife was possessed by a demon. But we literally took her through forgiveness. When you take someone through forgiveness, that demon, demonic present, has no legal authority yeah. to be in their church. Yeah. And it has to go in Jesus' name. Now, a lot of people are angry at God. So we have to literally have them Ask forgiveness for being angry at God. Many are angry at themselves or others. And again, so many people that are oppressed, it's anger turned inward. And we have to get them to forgive themselves. So again, one of the most important things we can do is minister forgiveness and receive forgiveness. And then all of a sudden, the, the torturers are rebuked, the devil's rebuked, and you're able to walk in the Spirit. But we have to start with removing the thorn of offense. If we don't, we're inviting the tormentors in. And one of the best examples of this, Mary, is her story. I call it the butcher knife story. It's the story of the butcher knife. Can we knife. have the music people come on up? Because we're going to start the ministry part. Worship. Come on up. Pardon? Oh, they're coming. Okay. Um, praise God. This is, this is difficult for me to share, what I'm about to share. This is not easy. Happened years ago. Um, I'm one of nine children. My father was in the military. He went to Vietnam. And when he came back from Vietnam... He was not the same father that left. He began to drink a lot. He was very violent, beating my mother. Our home became a nightmare on the weekends. The police would be called. And back then, you know, the truth is the neighbors, you know, hearing the screaming and the crying and all the kids, they'd call the police. And the way it was viewed then is women were possessions of their husbands. That's just the truth. And their kids. And so they'd come in and just say, hey, y'all need to keep it down. Not asking what's going on, what's happening here. Well, I was the oldest of my sisters. And my dad began looking at me the way a man should never look at his daughter. And I became very fearful of him with his violence and his stares across the room at me. And I'd come home from school and the doorknobs to my bedroom would be removed. And I knew what that probably meant. So I would start putting my chest or drawers in front of the door so I could sleep. But the demonic has a way of trying to reach you when it wants to reach you. And he would do whatever he could because this demon in him wanted to torment me. So my dad began to molest me and it was horrible thinking that at any minute my dad was gonna rape me. And I fought him off and my mother fought him off. And she took many a blow. I remember helping my mom wipe the blood off of the doors from the beatings that we endured. 
It was dark. It seemed no end in sight. And the worst part of it, my father was the usher at the Baptist church. So he would drag us to church on Sunday to, so that he could pay penance for the guilt that he was going through and tormenting and the demons that were being used inside of him. I remember sleeping at night with a butcher knife under my bed. And I thought tonight when he comes in, this is going through his chest. I know what hatred is. I know what bitterness is. I know what fear is. But I know Jesus now. I got out of that house as soon as I could. And I thought I'm gonna get as far away from that family and home and mess as quick as I could. Because see, when the police would come and they'd be talking, mom would be, Mary, please don't tell them what's happening. If your dad goes to jail, how am I gonna feed all the kids? So I kind of felt like the sacrificial lamb so my siblings could eat. So by the time I got out of that house, I was on my way and I thought, I'll figure life out, I'll figure it out. And I met a guy at a hospital and he said, why don't you come hear this preacher? And I thought I had enough of preaching. Been there, done that. But he was persistent. No, no, you need to hear this Christian stuff. No, you really enjoy it. I thought, well, all right, I'll go. And I sat back and I heard him share that, that if you don't forgive, neither can your Father in heaven forgive you. Whoa. And I said, where is that written to the person <laughs> sitting next to me? Where is that? And he gave me the Bible and I saw it with my own eyes and it was written in red. And I knew what that meant. So I thought, I'm gonna go down to the altar and I'm gonna have a little talk with Jesus. <laughs> I'm gonna negotiate something with him. So I came down crying to the altar, wanting him, because I knew I needed forgiveness because my heart was so full of hate. I knew I needed forgiveness. And I wanted to get that forgiveness. And Jesus, in the best way he could reveal to me, is he let me know as I'm crying and trying to negotiate with him, please don't ask me to forgive my dad. <laughs> please don't require me of this. That is just too hard. And he said, Mary, if I don't hold to the standards of my word, then I am not who the word says I am. And in that moment, I knew I needed him to be every dotted I and every cross T. I needed him to be everything the word of God says that he is. More than I needed to hold on to my pain and hurt. I needed Jesus to be all that he is. And he, in that moment, exchanged my life for his. He says, now, Mary, you have all authority in my name. You have all rights to my name. And what I'm gonna do through you, for you, is because you've exchanged your life for mine. That means that you surrender all rights to him. You have no more rights, none. You, you can't keep one foot in and one foot out and think you can be blessed. It's all in or nothing with him. He requires all of you, your past, your present, and anything he wants to do through you for the future. 
belongs to him. But the prerequisite is you must let him have it all. All. Yes. I want you to stand to your feet. I know there are people here that have struggled and you've wondered why your life hasn't gone forward and you can't figure it out. Why is it I feel like I'm stuck? It's not going any further. If you're waiting for God to choose you, you need to know something. He's waiting for you to choose him. <laughs> He just, he's already chosen you. What God's waiting for is you to choose Him and choose all of Him and ask Him to do all that He wants to do in your life and that you fully surrender. No more carnality. You commit tonight. I am never gonna be led by the carnal mind or spirit again. I'm going to be all of his, all of his. The carnal mind, the carnal spirit, my flesh is no longer going to dominate through me anymore. Can you hear what I'm saying? If you mean that right now and you want to cancel death, you want to be released, you want the fullness of all that he has for you, get down here right now. We're going to lay hands on you. Amen. Go ahead and pray. Break every chain. Praise God. Break every chain. Amen. Amen. Praise, Praise God. God. Praise God. Come on down. I want all. Amen. I want all. I want all. Praise God. Yes. Praise God. Let it go. Break every chain. Say, I 
give it to you, Lord. I give it to you. I give it all to you. In Jesus' name, that's the Holy Spirit right there. Praise God. Praise God. Look up. Look up. Give it to him. Give it all to him. Say, I give it all to you, Jesus. I'm not going to carry it anymore. I cancel the debt. Now fill me with your fire. Overflow. Let it go. The fire of God goes through my body. Fill me, Holy Ghost. Overflow. 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 Praise God. To break every chain. I cancel the debt. I cancel. Say, I cancel all the debt. Cancel the debt in Jesus' name. Let the fire go through him, Holy Ghost. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost go through him in Jesus' name. Cancel that debt in Jesus' name. Cancel it all in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus' name. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost go through you. Cancel the debt. That's it right there. Let the Holy Ghost. Praise God. that I had from the Spirit. This was in 1981. And when I shared it with Kenneth Hagin, he sat back in his chair and he said, you're gonna tell the graduating class this year what he just told you. A lot of people think Jesus' return is imminent. I don't agree. And I'm gonna tell you why. And you won't forget what I'm about to tell you because this came from the throne room. This was not Mary. I asked the Father, I said, Father, I wanna know, how will we know when Jesus is about to come back? And I'm not asking for the day and hour thing. I know the word enough to know what it says. But I also know that there's seasons that we can recognize. And I said, and this is an 81. And so I said, Lord, I wanna know how I will know your return is about to come. And he said, do you really wanna know? And I paused, cause I know his voice. And I said, yes, Father, I, I wanna know. I wanna know. And then he said back to me, do you really wanna know? Now that kind of shook me a little bit because I knew this was something he, wanted, he was about to say that maybe I wasn't prepared to hear. So I said, Father, how will I know? And this is what he said. When my people were in bondage, in Egypt, and the cries of the oppression of my people became great. Their cries became so great, heaven shook, and I sent their deliverance, Moses. He said, then came the law. And when the law became great, the oppression of the law became great, their cries again reached heaven and heaven shook and I sent my son. He said, the next deliverance will not be likened unto the other two. It'll not be a cry of bondage. It'll not be a cry of oppression. It'll be a cry of praise. 
And when praise covers the earth, the praises of my people, heaven will shake and I will send my son. There's about to be the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit and your sons Amen. and daughters will prophesy. Amen. Amen. You are that generation. generation. Amen. The outpouring has started. It's going to get deeper and more intense and stronger. Yes. And when the praises of his people cover the earth, yes. that's when he comes. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Praise God. Okay. Praise God. I don't know how to end this. Let's just give him praise. Amen. Father, praise we thank God. you. We thank you for yes. your word. Yes. We thank you for your spirit that you have a way of reaching into the deepest and most inner parts of each one of us in a way that nobody else can reach. And we thank you for that living spirit. We have a living God. We don't have a dead God. We have a living God and a living spirit. And you have shared your spirit with us. We are humbled, we are thankful. We appreciate your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we praise your holy name. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Praise, Praise God. God. I'm excited for you. <laughs> Woo! Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's just end with this song here tonight. That was so beautiful. Can we thank God for them? What a beautiful, so good, so anointed, so powerful, so relevant. Let's just worship with this song tonight as we go. And we'll have you guys tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Were you blessed? So blessed. So blessed by this. Worship team.
started tonight and I was talking about some other thing. A lady just walked over to me. I don't even know if she's still in here. She buried her husband on Monday. Drove all the way from North Carolina just to be here for the conference with her daughter. Walking through all of that. What felt like she needed to be in this kind of anointing in this company of the believers worshiping God this word tonight it was so timely really I, I, it, it just felt so weighty seriously you guys know I love to shout and dance and do all of that but something about this just felt so weighty so allow God to just do the healing. Allow God. I never knew what he was going to share on tonight, but I'm saying allow God to, to do the healing of the heart. Because he's obviously doing that. If you bought a book tonight, the $50 or more in the offering, if you gave that to get the book, they're out in the lobby. Remember to pick up your book tonight. <laughs> Jesus. I know it is random. Can we finish with this song? And we're going to do another one. You okay with that? No longer a slave. You split the seas so I can walk right through. Go Naomi. My fears were drowned. Just decree them.
Thank you that your peace is our rear guard. It is our vanguard. Thank you that your love encompasses round about us, even as the walls were round about Jerusalem. Thank you that you are the present help in the time of trouble. Thank you, God, that you have given us joy in the midst of adversity. Joy. Thank you for your joy tonight, God. Thank you that you have anchored us in you. Not in the world, but in you. Father, would you bless your people tonight? Bless your people. Keep us, oh God. Keep the worship team. Keep the speakers. Lord, let your anointing be in this house for tomorrow. And even for Saturday, God, you increase it. Thank you, God. Keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We thank you for who you are and for being here. See you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock sharp. Hug someone, high five someone. Tell them you look good. <laughs> you look good.